Valley Extension Program out of Talbot County is my service area. We would like to welcome y'all to the, our program today. And it's very informative. And uh, we have our animal science uh, specialist, Dr. Nikki Wickley. She would like to briefly describe the Agri-Unity Cooperative Extension LLC project. And at this time, I would like her to go ahead and uh, explain her project. Dr. Whitley. Right, so we're working with AgriUnity, a, a cooperative that has a lot of different ag interests, but the, the part that we're working on with Mr. Kennedy and the group is beef cattle marketing. And so beef cattle production and marketing. So we're working with producers trying to help them get higher prices, better prices for their animals. So we're, we talk about value added animals, selling live animals or selling beef as well. So anybody who's interested in maybe marketing together or getting more information about that, contact me um, or Dr. Noble here at Fort Valley State or Mr. Handy Kennedy at AgriUnity. And I can put my information in the chat box. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our Fort Valley State Field Director, Mr. Mark Thomas. He would introduce the speakers and we'll proceed on with our program. All right, thank you, Bobby. Thank uh, you. We'd like to welcome you all again to the FBSU Court of Extension Program. This is FBSU Extension Ag uh, Update, Marketing and Production of Beef Cow. We have three presenters for you today uh, from three different organizations. Um, up first, we will have Dr. We will have Mr. Terrell Hollis, and his presentation will be on outreach and services. And those outreaches and services will be for the FBSU Meat Technology Center, where Mr. Terrell Hollis served as manager. So at this time, we will, and he is scheduled to present from 1215. Um, we may be a little bit over or a little bit under, but he's scheduled to present from 1215 to 1235. We will make the necessary adjustments. Um, we ask at this time, if you have any questions for Mr. Hollis, you are free to put those questions in the chat box. If you have questions for any of our speakers that will be coming after Mr. Hollis, uh, you're free to put those questions in the chat box and we'll be sure to try to get all of those questions answered for you. And at, and, and at the end, we ask that everyone mute themselves while he is presenting. And then at the end, we will allow a few minutes for uh, questions that may not have been put in the chat box for each speaker as well. At this point, Mr. Pro Mr. Hollis has a PowerPoint. So Mr. Hollis, if you will go ahead and begin sharing your screen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Do I have good audio? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. I'll speak to you. Good afternoon, Terrell. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, like uh, Mr. Thomas has stated, my name is Terrell Hollis and I serve as the manager at the uh, Meat Technologies um, Center. Uh, the Meat Technology is also known as the Georgia Small Ruminant Research and Extension Center. The, extent, the Research and Extension Center is a two-part entity which includes a meat processing facility and a dairy processing facility. Um, over on the meat side, so we're going to give an overview of the Georgia Small Ruminant Research and Extension Center and all of the um, services that may be available for the community um to take advantage of okay during my presentation like i said we we're going to basically give the introduction we're going to talk about the um the meat center and the dairy center and talk about a few other things that's coming up along with different outreach opportunities that are available through our center and i'm um, also going to entertain any questions and answers um, I don't know if you want to do it at the end or we, you know, we can take time to do it as we go along if it's uh, something pressing. Okay, so this is the Georgia Small Ruminant Research, Research and Extension Center, the meat technology side. This is our front entrance view. Um, this is some of the pictures inside that facility to kind of give you an insight of what it looks like inside our facility and what its um, capabilities are when it comes to processing meat. The two photos that you see here are the um, inside of our harvesting room, also known as a kill floor. 
where we actually bring the animals in for harvesting. Okay, I uh, got a couple of pictures of some steaks that um, just for some visual aids, uh, these are some steaks that were cut in our plant just to kind of give you an idea of what we can do from that live animal all the way to a finished pro product. Uh, we'll scroll through a few more pictures of some carcass, beef carcass size. Along with beef carcasses, we also process uh, sheep and goat. Uh, the sheep and goat, as you can see in the top right corner, um, are some, some um, hanging carcasses that have been processed that um, were in pretty decent shape. Other areas in the processing plant include uh, the fabrication room, where we break down all those carcasses into different cuts. We have the capabilities in that room to produce ground products, uh, packaged products, things like sausage, bacon, um, just the whole nine yards, anything that you can think of, uh, we have the capability of processing in that facility. In that facility also we have in the bottom right corner is a um, computer lab which does um, sampling of different products, a taste test panel, and we can do a uh, taste test panel to see how each product turns out and um, it gives us information about how that product tastes and how well the public perceives it. Um, in, our, in our coolers, we have the capability of aging beef. As you can see, there's a couple of pictures of aged beef. As you can see, it's been hanging up uh, probably a few weeks there, probably approaching um, 14 to 20 days there. And as you can see, this carcass has a good fat coverage on it, so it can withstand that cooler for that um, amount of time. Some more cuts of some ribeye steaks. And uh, after it's all said and done, you want a good steak that looks similar to this. To give a little bit more about, a little more information about the services that we offer, uh, we kind of ask that all of our um, clients give us two to eight weeks notice uh, in advance before scheduling slaughter. Um, uh, these days, it may be up to uh, two months out, but for the most part, we should be able to get most people in, especially if they're looking at processing small ruminants, we should be able to get them in within two weeks. Um, the pro our process and our breaking down those carcasses is all based around um, is based around what we have on our slaughter schedule, and our slaughter schedule dictates you know how much processing and fabrication we can do throughout the week. Uh, our fees are as listed. For all cattle and pigs, we charge $40 per head as a um, slaughter fee. That slaughter fee takes care of uh, receiving that animal, uh, holding it in the holding pens, and um, taking it through the slaughter process all the way into our hanging coolers. Um, once, it's, once it's finished in the hanging cooler, it moves to the processing room, which we will retail cut or wholesale cut and uh, those fees are listed below, below. All of our cuts are 60 cents per pound um, of that carcass weight, whether it is uh, cattle, hog, sheep, or goats, the processing fee is 60 cents per pound. And the processing fee for wholesale cuts are 25 cents per pound. Um, just for example, if a farmer or a producer or a retail client wants to sell retail, um, wholesale cuts instead of retail cuts, uh, there's a uh, separate fee, uh, just because we don't have to do as much hand work. Uh, the slaughter fee for sheep and goats are $15 per head. Um, they're a little bit easy to handle, so our processing slaughter fees are a little bit cheaper than the cow and the pigs. Right. Uh, 
Uh, we, we offer different outreach um, throughout our facility. Uh, we do different trainings within that facility. Uh, we hold uh, all different types of, host all different types of seminars, uh, workshops, and um, we give a lot of one-on-one -on -one advice to farmers and people who are interested into in getting into the meat processing business. Um, we give a lot of tours, high school, elementary, and and just uh, farmers itself. Anyone who's interested in seeing what happens in a meat process facility, they have the opportunity to come and see what goes on in that facility. Uh, uh, taking the event that uh, COVID nineteen is in in um, in the midst of us, uh, there may be some changes to how we give tours and what trainings and workshops and things that take place, but for the most part, it's, it's coming back online where we'll be able to do those things as before. Um, uh, some of the training programs that we've done, we've done some HACCP trainings and um, some SSOP workshops where we can reach out to the farmers and, and help them to understand what a HACCP program is and how they can benefit from knowing about different HACCP steps and SSOP steps. As you can see, we involve our students on campus. Um, these are some students that help out on the farm and they're just helping with some of the um, young goat kids that have been born. We also bring our students into the cutting and fabrication room. Uh, these are, this is one, stu one group of um, students in animal science class top right and the students on the bottom right uh, top left and the students on the bottom right are ag discovery students that will help in the process uh, sheep and goats one day doing their program. Our outreach, like I said before, continue to uh, 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 place to do different tour groups. So a little like we had an alumni group um, from, I can't remember the year, but they were able to come and tour the facility and they weren't, there was not a, a meat processing facility there at the time of their attending Fort Valley. So they were very surprised to see what changes had been made. We have USDA officials come in and tour our facility um, from time to time other than the inspectors. So those are kind of exciting times when we have uh, different officials in to see our facility. The dairy side, um, the Georgia Small, Georgia Small Room and the Research and Extension Center had, you know, we talked about the meat side, now we're gonna to touch on the dairy side. As you can see, um, there's a, is a full dairy processing facility where we have bulk tanks, uh, like you see on your bottom right. And on the bottom left, we have, um, uh, the dairy homogenizers, uh, pasteurizers, I'm sorry. And uh, those, those are the units that are used to um, process milk. Some of those milk products as a finished product turn into soap, cheese, and ice cream. And in that dairy facility, we have the, the capability of processing um, all of those milk process, milk products into cheese, ice cream, and soap products and other items that can be made from milk products. Uh, just to talk about a few upcoming, upcoming things, uh, the Kale Building, the Center of Agriculture, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, it will have a retail store to sell different ag products similar to the ones that I've talked about in the Georgia Small Room Center. Uh, the use of, of agricultural research and corporate extension outreach to foster economic development throughout the community is one of the, the key aspects for this building. It will also assist small scale producers to build economically sustainable agribusinesses. And it will also acquire different students in um, building entrepreneurship skills. 
So the director of the Georgia Small Room and Research and Extension Center, Dr. Brooke Parker, he is our director. His contact information can be seen on the screen, also along with the dairy manager and the meat manager. These are some good contact information, good contact numbers. If you are interested in talking to any of us, please don't hesitate to call or email us. We'll be sure to get back in touch with you and help you in the best way that we can. All right, there, there any questions? Tell if you don't mind, would you stop sharing your screen momentarily? Say it again. Would you mind not sharing your screen uh, okay. right now? Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Are there any questions for Mr. Hollis at this time? If if so, please unmute your mic and uh, ask away. I guess a general question, Terrell, would you mind explaining uh, those two acronyms that you gave, gave regarding training like HESP? Would you explain what those are? What okay. that's for to the public? Yeah. No problem. Sorry about that. Um, hazard, uh, first of all, is uh, hazard analysis and critical control points. Uh, hazard analysis and critical control points are, is a um, it is a tool used by all plants that are inspected by USDA, and it it helps to identify critical areas in your process that um, may be a food hazard or, has, or possibly creates a foodborne hazard in your uh, process. So you are able to identify it and to put in steps and measures to control that hazard to a minimal point or you know eliminate it fully. Uh, SSOP is a sanitational uh, standard. Sanitation operating procedures is a written program that actually you follow step-by-step -step protocols so that you know exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to do it throughout your entire process. There's a whole lot more to that, but that, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, you got a few minutes, so, uh, you know. Okay, go ahead. It's, it's, just, it's really broad. If you in any particular um, area that you want to talk about, we can definitely kind of uh, jump off into it. Um, Um, Mr. Hollis, you can mention our workshops coming up June third and June and July eighth. Okay. So we do we do have some uh, hassle and uh, SOP workshops coming up on uh, next month, June and July, June the third and uh, July the eighth. Uh, that's going to be held in the uh, Georgia Small Room Research and Extension Center, and um, we're going to go a little bit more in detail about HACCP and, and SSOPs. So anyone who is interested in getting a, um, a, a more detailed understanding about what HACCP and SOPs are, are entailing, then that would be a good workshop for them to attend. I can okay. put the, sorry, I can put the link in the chat box and um, it will also cover sheep and goat production. And we will have a live demonstration of the processing of a carcass um, and live demonstrations of, of working um, goats hands-on and a sheep hands-on as well. All right, Dr. Whitley, if you would be so kind, that was going to be my question. If you all had a flyer or a link to those workshops, would you all mind sharing and putting those in the uh, chat box for the audience? Please. Thank you. Are there any other questions um, for Mr. Hollis before we move on to our next speaker? We have a few minutes. If we not, also, I'm sorry, we also have a cattle BQA training coming up and I'll put that in the chat box as well. You mind explaining, we got a few minutes. You mind okay. explaining what that cattle uh, sure. that workshop is going to be on? So as part of our beef cattle marketing program and working with AgriUnity, 
we're getting together groups that'll mark it together. And one of the things that we want the members to have, the members of the marketing group, so we have little cohorts of people who live fairly close together and who would have um, select bulls that have similar genetics so that, that their, their offspring are similar. Um, and we would like for them to um, handle their animals following beef quality assurance or BQA guidelines. BQA off is um, a certification program that's offered through National Cattlemen's Association and the Georgia Cattlemen's Association um, trainers have agreed to work with us and actually talk to between me and uh, Dr. Lee Jones at University of Georgia, an extension veterinarian, we, um, he wrote a grant and we got funding to offer some of these trainings for free to cattlemen. And the first one is going to be June 19th, which is a Saturday um, on Mr. Handy Kennedy's farm in Cobtown, Georgia. And we'll have one at Fort Valley State, and then we're planning one further south as well. So there's three that are included in that grant. And then I have a grant that we could offer others as well. So that's what that's about. Um, again, I'll put links and I have sent links out to the extension program to the county offices. So they should have flyers and links for those as well. So if you aren't sure, talk to your county office, um, or again, my contact information is in the chat box. But if you are on the phone and can't see the chat box, it's my email is Whitley, W-H-I-T-L-E-Y-N at F-V-S-U dot E-D-U. And will these workshops be posted on the web, on the F-V-S-U Ag website as well? Yes, um, Mr. Jeff Brothers indicated that he was posting those online as he made the flyers for us. Thank you. And if an individual wanted to join Agri Unity, would they contact you, Dr. Whitley? Or... Mr. Mr. Handy Kennedy is the contact for Agri Unity. I can put his uh, phone number in the box as well. Would you be so kind to do that? You all mentioned them uh, quite a bit in terms of working with them and that collaboration. So if in, in individuals who are interested in reaching out and knowing more about what they do, uh, it would be good to have their contact information in there as well. Um, at this time, are there any additional questions for Mr. Hollis and or Dr. Lee? If not, uh, I know there are some icons, but if you all would virtually uh, give Mr. Hollis a round of applause. And Mr. Hollis, quick question as it relates to your PowerPoint. Sometimes after these presentations, we get requests for those PowerPoints. Uh, will your PowerPoint be available to individuals if they wanted a copy of it? Yes, sure, no, no problem. Okay, okay. All right. So for those that are interested, if you would like a copy of uh, Mr. Hollis' PowerPoint, uh, just reach out to us at the end of this presentation. We're going to give you some more information as to how to do that. And um, we can basically make that PowerPoint presentation available to you. So once again, thank you, Mr. Hollis. Thank you, Dr. Whitley. We will move on with our program. Uh, up next, uh, we have grass-fed beef production and marketing. We have Dr. Richard Browning, and he is from Tennessee State University, which is in Nashville, the great state of Nashville, which is in Tennessee and in the city of Nashville. Beautiful city, by the way. Um, and he is an ag research scientist. So at this time, with no further ado, we will move on and we will present to you Dr. Richard Browning. And Dr. Browning, do you want questions while you present or do you want to entertain questions at the end of your presentation? I always like addressing them right at the point. So you know, if if somebody has a question during the talk, we can we can address it right there. Is I find it is easier to 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 kind of deal with them as we go through. So we may forget what we wanted to ask. Okay. Uh, and we have to go back to slide. So yeah, we can just do it as we go through if that's okay with you. Uh yes, sir. That is perfectly fine with me. And if y'all don't mind, do me a favor. I always like to ask this, and the speakers may not want to. 
But I know sometimes for our presenters, when they're speaking, you know, they want to see people. And right now, sometimes it's more engaging if we could see faces rather than sometimes names. And it's not a mandate, but if you all would honor a request of turning on your camera, if you're in a position to do so, if you're not, that's perfectly fine too. But we do want to uh, give our speakers some people that they can entertain with and engage in, especially as we begin to open back up. We're still in a virtual format, but there's no reason why we should be able to see one another and communicate. So at this time, Dr. Brown, the floor is now yours, sir. All right. Um, is it morning or is it afternoon? It's morning for me here, but I guess it's afternoon for you all. It is right after afternoon for us. Yes. So I guess I should say good afternoon, everybody. And you know, I, so I'd like to start off by, by thanking Mr. Price for inviting me, considering me for this for this um, program. I'm looking forward to interacting with you. And you know, thanks to Mr. Solomon and Mr. Thomas for, for co-hosting the event today. Let me see if I can get my slides brought up right fast and we'll get started. Y'all can let me know if, if if you're not seeing the slides, I've got them up, so I, we should be good. Yes, we, we can see them. Thank you. Yeah, they're good. Okay. All right. We're going to go through this really quick. Um, I was asked to speak about grass-fed beef, and so I put this presentation together last night, so hopefully there's no surprises in here for me. <laughs> you, uh, you hear them, right? Don't you hear them? I can't you hear. can keep your earphones on. Uh, we would ask that all people at this particular point in time, if you would mute your mic so Mr. Browning can go through his presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, so I'm going I'm to speak about, you know, grass-fed beef as a production offering primarily, but think of grass-fed beef as also a growth sector in, in animal agriculture and in the beef industry in particular. Uh, my name is Richard Browning, and I am a, an animal scientist at Tennessee State University. Some of you all may have sat in on some talks that we've given over the years on meat goats. Um, we've been doing meat goats for a while. We got back into beef cattle back in, in 2015. And as we go through this talk, all the images that you'll see are, are pictures of the university research herd. So you'll kind of give a virtual tour of the herd as we go through this presentation. Oh yeah, that's when they see it, right? Now, the basic expectation for, for most beef cattle production systems and certainly for a grass fed, grass finished system, it's conversion of, of whatever forages you have available, converting that forage into a desired and acceptable beef product. And we wanna do this at a profit. You know, unless you're doing it just for fun and games as a hobby, you're hoping to make money at this. And so some of the things that we'll talk about are geared towards not only production, but also profitability and sustainability as well. I usually give slot presentation with a lot of numbers, but this talk, this is the only slide you're going to see that has a lot of numbers on it. All right. So um, I said in the title that this is a growth sector. And in fact, if we look at the, the, um, the retail side of grass fed beef, we see, you know, from 2012 to 2016, tremendous growth and the expectations out through 2024 from 2020 to 2024 is we're going to see even greater growth. And so there's opportunity. When you see growth like this, that means there's opportunity. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is opportunity to do something a little bit different. Some of us may have been raising beef and you no know, commodity beef, traditionally produced beef, and look at it, you know, is there some other way I could do this and maybe generate a little bit more revenue, a little bit more profit out of my enterprise? And that's what we're talking about here. Okay. So why grass-fed beef? Why are we talking about this? Um, there are a lot of reasons why you might want, might want to consider grass-fed beef on the producer side. You know, niche positioning in the marketplace. You know, you might be providing a unique product that's not readily available to consumers in your area. Um, and this ties to local marketing. 
we know that that is a that's that's been a growing trend in agriculture. It's locally produced products, vegetables, and meats. And grass-fed beef really fits into that because we have you know, consumers that really want to see how these animals being produced, and they like to see these animals out in their natural environment, out grazing up to finish, and they can see the, see the animals that they possibly will be um, purchasing for consumption. Certainly in, in Tennessee and Georgia and the Southeast, we've got plenty of grass. And we see opportunities here to, to utilize this grass for more than just you no know, traditional cow calf production systems, but to carry beef cattle all the way to finish. So we've got plenty of grass here. And the, 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 the efforts towards regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing really ties into grass-fed beef production because regenerative agriculture is all about soil health and the soil development. And cattle are part of that whole system. Cattle contribute to the development of, of um, soil building if grazing systems are properly applied, okay? And some folks, it's just a preferred system of, of, of producing grief, beef. We just like to kind of go back to, to grass, if you will, kind of get away from the, from the feedlots in the, in the grain fed system and go to a, a more natural um, system. And some, some of us, we just like grass fed beef and we like it, so we like to try to raise it. And so there are a lot of reasons from a producer side why we may want to consider grass fed beef. In our production system at TSU, we're not, we're not finishing any cattle. We're, we're strictly cow-calf, but a lot of our customers, we sell all you know, steers, young bulls that will steer out. We sell pre pretty much all of them to, to grass-fed beef growers. And so although we're not, we're not producing grass-fed beef, we're providing grass-fed um, beef genetics and providing steers to producers that are going to carry them out to finish as part of their, their grass-fed beef um, production systems. The next time we get to talk about grass-fed beef, and we won't go into a lot of detail, a lot of discussion that you will come across on the, the, the advantages of, uh, or the differences between grain-fed and grass-fed. One of the questions kind of centers around environmental sustainability. It's a complicated issue. Now, there are some, some pros for grain fed, typically a smaller carbon footprint because they're harvested at a younger age. So they're not, they're not really contributing for an extended period of time to environmental um, concerns and we get a greater yield. So they have a small carbon footprint, but we see that on the grass fed side, we get greater sequestration of carbon and we get greater soil biomass accumulation. And this kind of goes to that regenerative agricultural um, 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 interest that's out there. You know, building, building you know, soil biomass, um, improving water filtration in, in the water cycles in our soil, improving you know, soil microorganisms, that sort of thing. And so these tend to favor grass fed production systems. And system-wide, the, the, the general thought is that grass-fed beef generates lower greenhouse gases. That's system-wide. Now, on an individual animal basis, because consumption and digestion of forage generates a lot of methane production, grass-fed cattle tend to produce more greenhouse gases. But when we consider you no know, the the grain production and the transportation that's involved in grain fed systems, we see a system wide you no know, reduction in greenhouse gas production if we look at a grass fed production system. Question number two, are there any advantage, advantages in palatability? There are a lot of producer side factors and a lot of consumer side factors that determine the palatability of beef. Um, in general terms, we see that that grain-fed beef is going to have more marbling. And we know that marbling contributes to the primary um, um, 
components of palatability, which are flavor, juiciness, and tenderness. And particularly, we consider the higher quality grades. We look at prime and choice beef. They tend to score really high on palatability scores, consumer um, um, acceptance of the product, if you will. Now, on the grass-fed side, we see greater intensity of flavor, um, unique flavors of these of these cattle that go through a grass-fed, grass-finished production system. They present unique eating experiences. Because a lot of consumers have not been exposed to grass-fed beef. We've had beef that you know that we've we've produced here, sold to 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 um, producers, and they send some of that steak, some of that beef back to TSU. And the folks here will 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 eat some of that, particularly in ground beef, and say this is totally different beef. They like it, but it's different. It's different from what they bought at Kroger or at Walmart. And so they, folks that have consumed grass fed beef for the first time here at TSU, coming from some TSU animals, have had overwhelmingly positive um, comments on the, the eating experience. And so there are some, there are some advantages on both sides, grass fed and grain fed, a lot of it goes to, to um, really consuming preference on, on what satisfies your palate. Okay, and then the third general question goes to the healthiness. You no, know, is, is is grass fed more healthy than grain fed, or vice versa? Overall difference are kind of modest, but they're generally consistent in that um, grass fed beef tends to have a lower total fat and calorie content, which means it's, it's going to be healthier from from a, a, health, a heart health sense certainly higher levels of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, higher levels of vitamin A, higher levels of vitamin E and other antioxidants, and a higher protein content per unit of beef. And so there are some certain advantages that we see with grass-fed beef over grain-fed. And so those are the three general questions that come up anytime a discussion of grass-fed, grass-finished beef comes up compared to grass-fed. There's pros and cons on, on all sides, you know, whether we're talking you know, grain versus grass on the environmental, the health, or the palatability. Now, since we're talking grass-fed beef, we have primary considerations. And each one of these, probably, we could probably spend an hour on each one of these. Um, but primary considerations are going to you know, include the cattle, the forages, the processor, and the market. All those are important components that we need to consider when we look at grass-fed, grass-finished beef. Let's start with the cattle. And that's where we, at TSU, we're spending a lot of our time on the cattle side of it. So we need a different kind of animal, we'll say. If we're gonna do grass-fed beef, versus grain-fed beef. Typically, for a grass-fed, grass-finished system, we need cattle that are small to medium in size. If we look at commodity beef in, in, in the primary breeds, Angus, Hereford, Charlotte, Gelby, these are large animals, and they've increased in size dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years. Back in 1970, the average cow weighed about 1,000 pounds, an Angus cow. Today, the average Angus cow weighs 1,400 pounds. Large animals, because that's what the feedlots are looking for. They're looking for large steers, and to get large steers, we need large cows and large bulls. We don't want that on the grass-fed side. We want small to medium-sized um, cattle, and they need to be hardy and easy keepers. Because if we're talking grass-fed, we're not doing a lot of supplementation very little in no grain. And so we can't be going out there putting feed out for these cattle if they needed to maintain themselves and if they grass fed, grass finished. Okay, so they need to be small to medium in, in size. And 
I think I'm, we, we run Dexter cattle here. If I didn't mention that, we run right now, we've got about 80 to 90 breeding cows right now um, and six Dexter bulls that we're running. And it's all geared towards this locally produced grass fed um, production system that probably is suitable for a small farm, a small operation that really cannot compete with larger commercial operations. And you're trying to find that little niche that you can generate a little revenue and a little profit with. And so the Dexters, this is my wife and she's only like about five, two. And these are full grown cows. Dexter cows are small frame, um, average about seven, about 700 pounds mature weight, um, but they're well suited for grass fed beef. And there are a number of breeds out there, not only the Dexters, they don't need to be that small, but there are a number of small to moderate frame cattle that will fit uh, a grass fed production system. You might want to consider some of the heritage breeds, you know, things such as Red Pole, um, Belted Galloways, even your piney wood cattle might fit in some cir cir circumstances. Um, there's some other breeds that are not necessarily heritage breeds, such as the, the low line Aberdeens um, and, and a couple of others that are out there that, that offer some unique benefits because they're well suited for grass production. The red pole is a good example of a more moderate frame animal that is, is, has the genetics that really do well in this kind of a system. It, it, it allows for a little bit easier marketing of your product because they're unique. So you got a niche system now, not only with your production system, but the breed that you're using to produce this grass fed beef. Small portion size is something we always talk about. Um, we're seeing that on the retail side that, that, that cut sizes have gotten large. We said steers are getting larger because the feedlots like them large but we're seeing issues at the retail se sector in terms of cuts being too large. And there's a term out there of, of cattle being too big for the box because of the way beef is sold in, you know, in the commodity sector, box beef. Um, and some of these breeds have real interesting histories um, or some really unique qualitative attributes that really lend themselves to marketing of their animals. Sometimes, you're the you're the beef consumer they like to they like to hear an interesting heritage story about the breed that they're that they're buying beef or, or even milk off of and i work with the lot conservancy and the lot conservancy is a nonprofit that really strives to to save and promote the use of heritage breeds not only cattle breeds but sheep goats swine poultry and certainly if you go to a lot of conservancy, you'll see a list of breeds that would be you no know, possible options if you want to go that heritage breed route um, for, for grass fed beef. But you can find smaller frame family lines in our, in our traditional breeds. If you can find some, some small frame Angus cattle, maybe some of the older genetics, um, Smaller frame, not, I'm not talking miniature Herefords, but the smaller frame, um, older genetic Hereford cattle, they may fit as well. You probably want to stay away from your continental breeds, your Charolais, your Limousines, your Gelbies. They really aren't very well suited, but your British breeds, your Red Pole, your Angus, your Dexter, your Hereford, um, Belted Galloways, those types of animals are more suited for grass-fed beef production systems. Okay. Regardless of what breed you select and go with in your breeding program, do not underemphasize, do not discount the importance of reproductive output. We're talking beef, which means we're talking growth and we're talking carcass traits, but if we're talking profitability, Reproduction is where it's at. And that's why we say a small to medium sized cow is going to be the better fit. Even in a, in, a, in a conventional system, we're finding out that large cows are inefficient cows. 
Growth and carcass are important, but it's reproduction that makes you the money. You can have the best growth and carcass genetics in the world, but if you don't have a calf, all that is of no value to you. You have to have a calf. And that's why reproduction is important. Particularly in these grass-based production systems, where we're not going to be doing an awful lot of supplementation if we can help it. Okay. Now, reproduction kind of goes with fitness and hardiness, along with survivability and staying healthy. And even with Dexter cattle, you know, they're not perfect cattle. And so we're looking at improving on some of the fitness in our herd through crossbreeding. And we're crossbreeding here with uh, another rare, unique breed. This is the, the, the Mashona from Zimbabwe. And we've got six of these bulls on the campus that we're doing crossbreeding with. And the first year that we've sold steers, those F1 steers, the customers have really sent back some positive reviews early on. Okay. And just so happens on Monday, we'll be having a shipment of Mashona cows dropped off on campus. So that's going to expand our research program even greater in, in small scale production systems um, for, for beef, particularly some of this grass-based beef production system. But that's the, the, the Mashona from Zimbabwe. And this bull here didn't weigh but about 1,100 pounds. And he's about a five-year-old now. Again, another small breed. I like to ask this question because some of the customers that we've sold steers to, they had three or four cows and they're trying to produce freezer beef. And the question I always ask, and even in some of these new farmer talks is, to produce grass fed beef, do I have to own cows? Do I have to be breeding cows? Do I have to go through the whole process of, of AI or owning a bull and dealing with open cows and preg checks and all that? Do I need to do all that to produce grass fed beef? Anybody can answer that, yes or no. Do I need to own cows to do this? No. No, exactly. You don't have to. You can just go out and buy wean steers. Keep, keep in mind, most of the risk in beef cattle production, whether it's grass fed or other, most of the risk is on the cow-calf side. I can take a lot of that risk out if I just go out and, and buy steers. And, and this is what we do. There's a group of steers that we sold this past year, some Michonne across and some straight Dexters. And so if, if, I, if I'm trying to market X number of, of beef steers, I don't have to go through the price of breeding a bunch of cows to get those steers. I have open cows. I might get a bunch of heifers. You just never know. Or I can go out and buy exactly what I know I need. And we've had a couple of our producers that has, you know what, that makes sense. They sold the three or four cows and their bull, and that is a buy steers every year. And it gives you a lot more flexibility in your, in your grazing management when I've got steers versus a, a, a small group of breeding cows. So something to keep in mind, if, if, you're, in the, if you're interested more in producing beef, this may be the option for you is buying steers instead of trying to run a small breeding herd, okay? Now, some, some of our folks are more of the homesteader type that are wanting to do dairy as well, and then you got to have some, some Dexter cows or something similar to that if you're trying to produce you know, dual purpose, because Dexter's a really dual purpose breed. Um, but we're looking at it for the beef attributes. So moving from the cattle, moving from the cattle, you know, we look at this situation, this scenario where our production is, is supposed to be 100% forage based. That means land management, soil management, and supplemental forage management are key. That's important. So we've dealt with the animals, the kind of animals that we need. Now let's look at the, the forage just real briefly. Again, this is another hour, two hour talk with a forage specialist itself. Um, I've got where I found this, this graphic from, but I really like it. Know your forages. I was going to say, know your forages. Know, know what you have available at forage, tropical perennials, know your, your Bermuda grass, your, your Bayou grass, some other, you know, crab grass, perhaps, your tropical annuals, and know that you go from cool season perennials, annuals, and legumes, that the level of forage quality is going to change, and that's going to influence the performance of your animals. 
So you have to know what forages are available and what's going to work in your particular production system throughout the year. You know, from, 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 from spring to summer to fall and even into winter. You want to test your soils and you want to test your forages. That's the only way you're going to really know what you're working with. You know, forage, whether it's your, your green forage or even your hay, if you're buying hay in the wintertime because you're really trying to um, get a handle on, on what level of performance you can expect out of your animals, your cows and your steers. And it's gonna be based on you know, the forages and whether you need to supplement that forage with something. And really with grass fed, you're really limited. You just can't, you can't go out and just start putting pellets out or corn out for these animals. Because at that point, it's not grass fed, grass finished anymore. Understand grazing management. Again, a whole hour talk to me given on just grazing management, grazing systems. You know, anything from just continuous graze, non, you know, continuous graze, no rotation, non-selective grazing of the animal, all the way to this ultra high intensive grazing management where you're moving your animals every three or four hours of every day and everything in between. It's got to work for you. And that's important because you're trying to maintain an adequate forage quality and quantity throughout the year. But be prepared for wintertime management. We know that's a challenging time for forages and prepare for drought conditions because that's going to disrupt everything that you do. And every year is going to be different when you start looking at forage management. Every season is different. Every year is different. So you have to be flexible. You got to be dynamic. And if we look at this 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 herd of um, cows at, at at our satellite farm, it's a lot easier if I'm running a group of steers to make changes. If I've got to depopulate, I've got to lower my stocking rates because of drought or poor hay quality or poor hay availability. It's a little bit more challenging to do that if I'm running a cow herd. They don't have quite the flexibility. I can sell off some cows, um, move them to another location, but it's a little bit more challenging. So if you're running a cow herd, it's probably more critical to stay on top of this if I'm running steers. Because I'm running steers and I'm running to issues, it's easy to liquidate those steers without an awful lot of, um, of economic hardship. Okay, the other two primary considerations, I just have a couple of bullets for them, the processor. We find that oftentimes this is a system bottleneck, particularly in the last year or two. We have producers now, we have folks that are buying steers now. This year, we got somebody from North Georgia coming up to buy some steers in a couple of weeks. He's already has uh, he's already has kill dates booked a year out because there's a there's a a, a a deficiency in the amount of processing capacity certainly here in Tennessee and apparently in North Georgia as well where you're having to book it in process right now they're booking dates for 2022 and we're talking about spring summer 2022. And so oftentimes, and I, and I didn't realize this until we started looking at a cold cow, that if you think you're going to just call a processor and you're going to be able to get in, I've got a steer ready to go where a cow want to process for, for a buyer, and I'm going to do that in the next, I'll probably in the next month or so, you're going to be out of luck. And so you want to form your relationships early because while you grass it, you're doing your own processing. You're not, you're not taking cattle to the auction barn. That's not your, that's not your source of revenue. Your source of the revenue is taking these animals to finish. If they're doing like what we're doing here, you're selling steers to, to other grass fed finishers. But if you work with the process of form relationships early and schedule very early, I saw, um, horses, what, two to eight weeks out. And I'm like, man, if folks around here could get into a processing facility in two to eight weeks, I mean, they'd be all over it. So like I said, we're right now, people booking out 12 to 18 months right now. But that's important. 
and then on, on the marketing side, we like to say have a marketing plan in place when you put the bulls out with the cows. Because it's that it's that marketing plan that's going to somewhat dictate how you breed those cows. Or if I'm going out and buying steers, I already kind of know how I'm going to market these steers. And like I said, up here, if I'm buying steers now, I need to be already booking kill dates for those steers. Because we're going to finish these steers, they'll usually finish 20, 24, 26 months of age. And so I've got about a year before they're going to be ready to go. So I need to secure those kill dates right now. Don't wait. I'll wait till I see how the steers look. And then I'll you know a couple months after I book, you're going to be out of luck. You'll be hanging on to those steers for an extra six to eight months minimum. Okay. Are you selling cattle or are you selling beef? It makes a difference. Legally, it makes a difference. A lot of our producers, they're selling cattle. And so they buy the steers, they're growing for a year, and then they're going to sell those steers to somebody else and assist, you know, taking those steers to the processor and helping the, the, the customer, you know, work with the processor on developing cut sheets and those types of things. So in that case, you don't really need to worry about the USDA. And that's why a lot of people sell cat live cattle. They don't have to deal with the USDA side of it. Once you decide you're going to sell beef instead of cattle, and I'm sure you know, Cheryl can, can probably address this issue much better than I could. Once you decide I'm going to sell beef instead of cattle, it's a whole different deal. That's when the USDA comes in. That's when you have a lot of, of added restrictions and regulations on what you can and cannot do. And so Think about that as you kind of get into this local marketing, whether it's grass fed or even if you're doing some, you know, you do mostly grass fed, you're going to put them on grain for like the last 30 to 60 days. Make a decision. Am I going to sell cattle, finish cattle, or am I going to sell beef? Very important question that you have to answer. Seek feedback. You no, know, this marketing process is, is all about um, building relationships with, with customers. Your beef customers or your cattle customers. Like I said, at TSU, we sell steers. And so I'm always contacting the folks that we sell steers to to find out how the steers are doing. Do they like them? Now we've got these Mishona crosses that we're producing. How do you like them compared to the straight Dexters? So we're selling both now. And it kind of helps us understand not only what's going on with the research animals, but also um, where there may be opportunity for further work. And you always want to um, you know if, if this is like any other business, you, know, you want to be able to come get that feedback information, generate that information to kind of help you improve your production system. And then the last thing I have down here, which I can't see, let's look at move this. Okay. This one thing that you have to be aware of, which is grass fed local produce, be ready to put in the effort here with the market. The cattle typically are not going to sell themselves. And whether we're talking grass fed beef, we're talking goat, meat goats, local dairy production, what have you. This is where I think we got a marketing presenter after me. So this is where a lot of small scale production systems fall short is on the marketing. You have to put in the in the effort to build your market because you're doing something different. And so you've got to, you know, you've got to get 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 the word out on what you have. And, and I won't say much more on that, other than if you particularly with the genetics that we're talking about here. Dexter cattle, um, these Delta Galloway, some of these other smaller breeds. You don't want to get into a situation where, well, I can just take them to the cell barn if, if this other business doesn't work out because you're going to pretty much get hit. These are not cattle that are well accepted at the cell barn. Okay? So keep that in mind. 
Now, some of them, the red poles um, and a couple of others that are out there, they may be moderate size to kind of hit the kind of right at the floor of what the commodity B folks are going to be looking for. But usually you're going to, you're going to get hit if you take these calves to the auction board. So keep that in mind. So once you get into something like this and you pick some of these smaller genetics for your grass fed, you got to be all in. Fortunately for us, you know, we've been, we've been doing this for five years, six years now, and we probably have produced 80, 70, 80 steers. Um, and we've only taken one steer to the auction bar. We've been able to sell everything off the farm. Um, and it's because it's a, it's a growth sector. We're producing a, a unique type of animal. Um, and so again, it's opportunity there to do this. I think this is the last slide I have. Everything we kind of rushed through, and I think we kind of rushed through it just in the interest of time. Um, information is important throughout the process. Everything from recording birth weights on your calves, potentially, um, to hopefully getting carcass information on what you're selling, or certainly you know, all those points in between, reproductive rates in your cow herd. We said it's, it's really critical to profitability, the growth rates, you know, the quality of your forages. If you're really into forage production, how, how are your forages doing? You know, what's my, how much hay am I having to buy every year relative to what I'm able to, um, to you know, carry through my, my grazing management and stockpiling the forages? The prices that we're able to receive for these, for these cattle. All this is important because again, I'm, my, my assumption is always that these systems that we talk about when I stand up in front of a, a group of meat goat producer, now cattle folks, my assumption is you're trying to turn a profit. You don't have this money to throw away and it's all fun and games. You're trying to make some money with this. And so if you're trying to make money at this, not get rich, not quit your day job, but for every dollar I spend, I get a dollar a dime back. That's a 10% return, right? Information is important. We've seen with our goat research that there's some breeds that we use them, we're gonna lose money. Without a doubt, it's, it's a losing proposition. Some of the other breeds that we've worked with, we've made money, we've actually generated a profit, a nice little return on investment. It's the same thing here with our with our um, with this grass fed beef. My focus is primarily on the cattle genetics side of it, but no matter what we do, you have to be gathering information. And we have some of our buyers now that are buying steers, and they don't have scales. They're using weight tapes, which is better than nothing. But you have to be able to gather information to know where you're at. Otherwise, you don't know if you're making money or, 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 or losing money. I always get, tell the story about the, about the producer that, that sold animals for $1,000 and didn't realize they spent $1,500 to produce that $1,000 animal. But they got a $1,000 check in their hand. They think they made some money. But all they did, they generated revenue, but they lost money. You can generate revenue and lose money because growth revenue is not profit. Okay, so information is important, always important. That's the end of my talk. Um, There's my email address. If, 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 um, once this presentation's over with and, and you go home and you think about some things, and you know what, there's something else I want to ask, I, I would have liked to have asked, um, shoot, shoot me an email. We do have a website, and if you just do type in in your favorite web browser type in my name richard browning and tsu that website will come up um and we've got some pages with some general information on the cattle on our cattle production system as well as you know, what we're doing with the goats um so that's it that's it it's calving season now and so if, if so so this is a deal where um, 
be careful when you're driving out in your pastures because you never know what you're going to run come across when you're out looking for, for newborn calves. Okay, that's all I have. Um, Mr. Moderator. Yes, sir. I'll back over to you. All right. At this time, we will open the floor up uh, for any questions that individuals may have. Dr. Browning, if you would be so kind as to stop sharing your screen with us. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, the floor is now open for questions for Dr. Brown regarding his presentation on grass-fed beef and marketing. Yes, Dr. Browning, this is Dr. Latricia Wilson. Thank you for your presentation. You seem to imply that um, the small, medium frame animal um, is the best for doing your grass-fed um, operation. And I understand you have a cow-calf. I do understand you're in Tennessee where there's a heat tolerance and things of that nature that we don't have to address as well as in the further in the south we go. However, my question is if a farmer has Angus um, cattle breed, they are probably more of a medium frame animal as opposed to the small to medium frame. So instead of getting up to 700 pounds, you're able to get up to 1200, 1300 pounds when you finish them all. Therefore, you're more likely to make more of a profit and still get the same quality and taste things that you're looking for in the grass fed beef that you did with the smaller frame so my question to you is um, why, um, what is it about the small frame other than, I mean, you can get Angus that are easy to breed also. They're more heat tolerant. Is there something specifically why you prefer the smaller to medium frame? Um, a, couple, a couple of points there. For, if, as far as the Angus, um, you're, you're gonna be, you'll be hard pressed to find some Angus cattle that would be considered heat tolerant. They're pretty, they're pretty susceptible to heat stress. Um, but as far as, as far as the, the the size, it's the time to finish. Larger cattle will take longer to finish, and typically the larger cattle have been selected for for growth on grain. And so we move these these same genetics to a grass fed production system they're probably not going to finish as fast because we're not grain feeding them. So keep in mind that these large, even the Angus have gotten larger. They've gotten larger because of their, their, um, their need for an awful lot more higher input, higher, higher intake, I should say. And so what we see if, and oftentimes this is a point I, I took this slide out. We always think of profitability and, and productivity on a per animal basis. We may need to rethink that. What are we producing on a per acre basis? If we think of, of crop production, we don't think of productivity per stock of corn or per unit of, of grass, we think of in terms of per acre. So how much beef are we producing per acre? And what we see in those scenarios that as cattle get smaller, we're losing some per animal productivity but we're gaining on a per acre basis. And oftentimes it's, it's the land that's one of the most expensive inputs in a production system. Land is not cheap. So we can increase our productivity per acre, um, then we might increase the, the overall bottom line in terms of profit or loss. And another thing about small, small frame cattle, just on the reproduction side, we see that cows that are a thousand pounds and lighter or more reproductively um, efficient than a cow that's 12 to 14 or 1500 pounds. And so there's some efficiencies there. Um, and so even with commercial, in the commercial beef sector, commodity beef production, they're realizing that the cows have gotten too big. They're trying to scale them back. I'll tell you another real a, a breed that's getting really popular in, in the Southeast, y'all probably heard of it, is, is I've mentioned the red pole, but one of the composites out of a red pole is the South Pole. And that's a small breed that's really gaining a lot of popularity in, in grass-fed production systems. These cows are about a thousand pounds. And um, there's not a, a lot of research that's been done on them, but just looking at producer 
um, testimonials, if you will, they seem to be really um, well suited for, for grass-based production systems. But heat stress in this part of the country, heat stress is going to be a real issue, particularly for your for your um, your your popular breeds like your Angus and your Hereford. Um, that's why in the South, you know, Brahmin and, and Brahmin crosses are real popular because you know they could you know you, if you put an Angus cow up against a Brangus cow, that Brangus cow is going to run rings around that Angus cow in terms of productivity because she's not heat stressed like that Angus cow is going to be. Now we're, we'll, but, but Brangus cattle are large cattle. We're talking about cows again that are 13, 14, 1500 pounds. Really good for commodity beef production, but not necessarily suited for, 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 for grass fed, grass finished, smaller scale um, beef production. That's why we introduced the Mashona to see we can kind of get that heat tolerance in a smaller package. One thing about the South Pole, they've got Center Pole and Barzona. Um, they they have some heat tolerant genetics in their background, but it's a the, the South Pole. I haven't worked with South Pole. I've, I've visited with producers that run them, and they really seem to like them. Hope that answers your question. Let me, let me cut in here. We got time for one more question. Uh, hopefully, uh, Dr. Wilson, did that get your question answered? Uh, yes, that's that's. Thank you so much. Okay, we have time for one more quick question uh, before we move on to our next presenter, if there is one. I have a question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Brandon, what is your opinion of uh, seed stock producing? Seed stock producers? Yes, sir. We need them. If we're, if, 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 if we're talking about um, grass-fed beef production systems, oftentimes we're maybe crossbreeding. Like, we're crossbreeding now. Half of our herd is being crossbred. So as a seed stock producer, you have to determine what segment of the of the industry are you trying to serve. Would you like to serve the, this, 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 this grass-fed production sector? Or would you like to or would you like to service the, the, the larger commodity beef sector? And that will kind of determine what breed you're going to go for in terms of the seed stock operator. But not a grass fed is growing, but it's still a small sector. It's probably less than five percent of all beef that's, that's sold in the U.S. is grass fed, which is interesting because in most other parts of the world, most of the beef that's produced is grass is grass fed. The U.S. is probably the only country that has a, a significant feedlot sector. All the countries that are really getting into. Now you 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 mentioned the difference between Brangus and Angus being heat tolerant. Yes. Um, the Brangus carries much less hair than the Angus does. That's the reason the Angus is not heat tolerant. But uh, in the industry, the Angus does uh, produce more of a marbling in their offspring that sells much higher on the market. True, true. But think about this: if I get a higher, if I get a higher pregnancy rate, which one of those herds is probably going to be more profitable? The one with more calves, or the one with with higher quality calves? Well, that. the the high quality calves would do better because we have a tendency to do what we call embryo transplant or uh, either AI. So we can we can have our animals more uniform. Uh, than a commercial breeder, just a normal commercial breeder. I mean, okay, you're, you're okay. You're speaking in terms of seed stock. That's that's fine. correct. That's yeah, correct. If you're a seed stock producer, I'll say if you're a seed stock producer and you want to raise Angus, my suggestion would be to, to move towards animals that are more moderate frame. And one thing that we're starting, that we're doing and you can do in your herd is you go into your herd, you may see a difference. In cows, in terms of when they lose their hair coat, if you that's correct. Her, you'll see some cows that slick off earlier than others, and not by that might be one of those traits that you look at because we can move an Angus herd to be a little bit more tolerant of heat, and that's one of the traits that we may look at is is hair shedding. You said that even with our Dexter cows that some cows were shedding their hair earlier, and what we found is that those cows that shed their hair earlier have higher weaning weight and higher pregnancy rates than those dextra cows that have 
with longer retained hair though. Which would be pertaining to the climate they're in too though. The climate has a lot to do with the hair, I believe. It does. It does. Yeah, yeah, I, does. I hate I hate to cut this discussion off, even though that's okay, no problem. But uh in the interest of time and we do have another speaker, and we want to be mindful <laughs> of his time and his presentation as well. So if you all would like to continue, feel free to put uh, all your comments and or questions in the chat box and y'all can chat away. But we have yeah, to we, move on to the next speaker. Yeah, we can well. chat, chat or, or send me an email. I will. I will. Thank you very much. Give me a call. Thank you. All right. Sure. Uh, so let's give uh, Dr. Browning a virtual round of applause by your emojis on your computer to hand clap. And we will move on in the interest of time to the next speaker. And Dr. Browning asked the question, are you selling cattle or are you selling beef? So that tie goes into the next presentation by Mr. Lee Lancaster. Uh, he's from, he's, he's with Georgia Grown Program for the Georgia Department of Ag. Uh, he's a specialist in their marketing division. And the title of his presentation will be Rules Regulations on Selling Meat as an Individual. So without no further delay, uh, we present to you, uh, Mr. Lancaster. You have to unmute your mic, Mr. Lancaster. Thank y'all. I tried to do the do the uh, share screen the other day, and uh, it was not good. So I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> as as well as I can. I appreciate y'all giving me a few moments. Our team met back in July of 2020, and we discussed the problems that we have, maybe some opportunities to um, produce beef and uh, process it on the farm. And also pork was one of the, one of the species that we talked about. And we looked into several different options. And in the state of Georgia, it has to be um, processed for, you know, for, for retail or wholesale it has to be inspected by the USDA or, or you know, the Georgia Department of Agriculture Red Meat Division. So um, what we've come up with is starting June the 1st, we will be launching a, uh, a program with the agriculture website called the Farm Start Program. And what we're going to be doing is, is taking new farmers, maybe somebody who wants to further process what we, you know, lots of times you call it value added. Um, we do those things and, and help people make the connections with the industry in order to be able to take um, animals from the farm, get them processed, get them into a, you know, into a um, inspected packaging and and be able to sell that product to the consumers directly from the farm. I think one of the things that the um, pandemic has taught us is people really want to know where things are coming from and it gets down to um, people want to know, they want to see who produced some of the things if it's possible. And the consumer, is willing to pay a, a lot more for uh, that peace of mind and comfort. And sometimes there's a, a little bit more price in, involved as you can imagine. And sometimes it's, it's pretty competitive. So um, we're gonna be working with, with the general public, anybody, uh, cattlemen, uh, farmers, produce, farmers who would like to uh, market their products. You think about the state of Georgia, you think about peaches and you think about pine trees and poultry, but we have a huge amount of, of um, produce in the state of Georgia with the Vidalia onion and, and carrots and things like that. Companies are moving out of California to Georgia because we have water. And some of those uh, farms are calling me and, and uh, a lot of the other folks in Georgia grown needing to move, needing to find their products to be 
<clears throat> needing to sell the product and things like that. And also uh, restaurants are, in, are very interested in Georgia grown products, um, whether it be produce, a lot of folks are looking for Vidalia onions, uh, blueberries and things like that, but also uh, Georgia grown cattle, uh, beef, you know, uh, Josh and I talked about uh, sheep yesterday. We have a lot of uh, folks that are producing uh, um, sheep for meat and things like that. So those are some of the things that we would, we're working to connect people and being able to navigate through some of the regulations that, that it takes. Um, we typically get in touch with the folks and what we were talking about earlier in the presentations um, I've talked to a lot of our farms about how long of a wait it takes to get a slot to process. And we have a not a huge amount of processors in the state of Georgia, but we do have um, a pretty good amount, especially for uh, cattle and, and goats and sheep. Not necessarily a lot for the hogs, but um, we try to get them in touch with those. And then, and then this farm start will we'll get you connected with the division that you need to talk to because you're not necessarily going to get into the business and get everything with one phone call because you think about some of the other divisions within the state agriculture department that may be regulating some of the things that you're wanting to do and also the health department and maybe even DNR. So um, we're working with our, our start program to be able to get you uh, navigated through those things because a lot of times, even before now, we've talked to some folks and, and I, I just try to get them calmed down because, you know, a lot of times they'll start the, their conversation with this is the fifth phone call that I've made and we're hoping to um, um, we're hoping to cut through that and then just use the, the term one-stop shop to to be able to get folks uh you know in good shape and to be ready you know have a have a product that is ready for the public you know there's not a whole lot of learning curve with it we don't have you know uh, a situation where things are uninspected making it into commerce and you've worked for two years to produce those animals and then it's unsellable. So a lot of folks that we talk to, we're trying to get that uh, straightened out before anything like that happens. One of the thing, a couple of the things that came out of the farm start meeting is uh, we have under USDA regulations, any processor less than 20,000 birds per year are processed on can be processed by an individual of their own raising, and they're not going to have to go under USDA inspection. We've worked with uh, several different divisions: food safety, red meat, and our marketing division to adopt and the the twenty thousand or less guidelines, and they are ready for signature by the commissioner if he hadn't already signed it today and so uh, those are gonna that's going to be a new uh, opportunity for a lot of folks to do um, on the farm poultry processing farm raised uh, grass fed po uh, pasture raised uh, um, poultry too and those are those are going to be under under the uh, farm start with the Georgia grown and another thing that we've done one of the things that happened during the pandemic was we were not able to uh, work with the public that produces uh, table eggs and so a lot of those people you have to have a candler's <laughs> license to be able to sell eggs to the public and the commissioner asked us to to formulate and to get started with a online egg candling program 
and it's it's uh, we have trained about 350 to 400 between 350 and 400 individuals this year over Zoom to to be able to grade and and market their eggs. A lot of those people are going to the farmers markets, but um, uh, some of them are doing things, you know, door to door, selling directly to the consumer. And so that's uh, that's another one of the things that uh, that we're doing. So, like I said, uh, a couple of the other things just to make connections with the public that have questions about cottage foods. We can also uh, direct people on those uh, with questions about cottage foods because people hear that word and they think that, well, I can make this and this. There are some things that do require training. Uh, some things require a week's worth of training and some things require uh, specialized equipment. Mr. Hollis was talking about uh, HACCP a while ago. There's a lot of different, uh, HACCP goes through many different things. Anytime that you take a, an agricultural product and turn it from a living organism to a shelf stable product, sometimes it's, uh, it takes, there are control points that have to be documented to, to prevent uh, foodborne illness and things like that. So we talk you know, talk folks through on the options and get them connected with uh, usually a processing authority to get that training so that they can, you know, continue on with something like that. Um, just giving folks the knowledge and to be able to get regulated and, and, and be legal and produce the things that they want to do. And there are some goals that people have in mind and we help them to talk through these things and just like I said, get in touch with the folks that they need to get in touch with. And that's what the, uh, the farm start is going to be doing. And so one of the guys that I talked to uh, last week had mentioned he's going through uh, Fort Valley State to do his processing. And I imagine we'll be, you know, we'll be directing a lot of folks in that direction. And, and it, it's just, um, like I said, folks just don't know the capabilities of some of the plants. And some folks don't know the connections, they don't have the numbers and they don't know the folks that they need to talk to. And they really don't know the questions that they need to ask a lot of times. And we're gonna to try to help them, you know, to, to expand their business and get into business. So that's pretty much what we're working on right now. And um, I, my contact is uh, lee.lancaster at agr.georgia.gov. I'll put that in the uh, in the chat box if y'all have any questions about any of that after the uh, program gets done. And I appreciate y'all for uh, having me here. Do we have any questions for Mr. Lancaster? Yes, Mr. Lancaster, is there any funding from, from your organization um, for beginning farmers who want to get into possibly exporting their products, things of that nature. Do you all make any resources available for them? A lot of the stuff, there's lots of programs, SUSTA comes to mind uh, for what, for, for exporting, for uh, expanding new markets and things like that. And our uh, division director, Paul Thompson and Chris Rash, they, they are definitely some, they are experts in this. Uh, they, uh, before the pandemic, Paul went to several different countries to expand on these things. And what we talked about was there is some funding available to, to get your products into some of these other countries. Uh, they may not have to go all the way to Taiwan. You know, they may be some of these, these uh, countries that that, that are very nearby, you know, you can, uh, but yeah, there's, there are, there are, there is uh, definitely um, funding available. You just have to, like I said, we, we can get, get folks in contact with, uh, with our folks to get that, uh, you know, get that conversation going. Thank you so much. 
Thank you all. Any other questions? Have time for one or two more questions. If not, we're going to, uh, it's on the program, but it's not scheduled um, in print on the program. We have a member from the Georgia Cattlemen's Association, and they wanted to take a few minutes to uh, talk to us about some opportunities uh, with their association. So at this time, we're going to give them a few minutes to uh, speak to you all in terms of the opportunities uh, that exist with their organization. <laughs> Absolutely. Mr. Mark, thank you for uh, having that. Um, just wanted to take a, a quick moment and let you know all of the uh, different things that GCA is currently working on. Do you mind introducing yourself real quick, sir? Absolutely. My name is Dale Sandlin. I'm Executive Vice President for Georgia Cattlemen's Association. Um, so some of the, the biggest things, and, and it's been mentioned here already on the call, but our cattle markets, uh, currently the price disparity that we're seeing between uh, the price of box beef and what cattle producers are receiving uh, when they go to sell those animals is cons considerably out of uh, out of whack. So what we have been working on uh, within the office is working with our congressional delegation, uh, focusing on the Department of Justice investigation that has currently been going on for some time now uh, since the Hutchison plant fire back in 2019 but also into uh, the other, uh, what's the best way to say it? Unfair uh, pricing structure that uh, some of the processors have seen in the other uh, protein sectors. So we're working on that as well as uh, trying to ensure that we see that imbalance and that, that disparity go away. Uh, our industry has historically not uh, acted with congressional intervention, uh, allow the markets to work in a free market system. However, as we, uh, as we continue to move forward in our industry, if we accept, expect to be sustainable, we have to flip that script. We have to make sure that we are, uh, that our producers are able to remain profitable in all that they do. And unfortunately, unless uh, we see some, some change from the packing industry, which we uh, have not seen in especially over the past year, um, COVID withstanding, but the past two years, it's not gonna change. And so one of the bills that GCA is advocating for on Capitol Hill is the Cattle Market Transparency Act, which would uh, allow for um, the Secretary of Agriculture to set negotiated cash purchases of cattle. That's uh, cattle that are bought at the stockyard. It would also uh, create a contract library similarly to what they have in swine. Um, that would allow for producers to understand what the pricing structures are out there, what are the current formulas that they're being paid on, what are the discounts, and shifting that uh, that uh, reporting up to uh, instead of one week and behind uh, being two weeks ahead. So uh, provide more transparency for the cattle industry and, and allow us to reach um, you know price discovery in a much uh, simpler fashion, but also to provide those producers with the uh, money coming down. And so we've been working on that. Also uh, looking at the tax code and specifically changes in section uh, 2032A, uh, which would uh, expand the exemptions for the step up in basis. Uh, right now it's 750,000 is, the, is that, uh, that threshold the bill that we've been advocating for will be uh, shift that up to 11.7 million. And that's important for our industry because our producers are, uh, you heard it already here today that uh, land is one of the highest inputs that we've got. And when you're passing that land down to your heirs, you uh, most producers are land rich and cash poor. And so in order to pay the uh, tax burden that is owed, um, when that property is transferred from, from parent to heir, uh, a lot of times we're seeing at least uh, in some cases up to a third of the family farm having to be sold off just to afford the tax burden that's required there. So we're, we're looking at that as well. And then obviously, as mentioned here as well, processing capacity. Um, when we entered into 
the pandemic, uh, we had record number of cattle on feed and a significant shortage of hook space uh, to start with in our processing infrastructure and uh, COVID only exacerbated the problem and really brought it to light. And so one of the things that we're working on is uh, trying to develop a uh, meat cutting training program for those processors. One of the biggest struggles they have got and in order to ramp up capacity and the ability to uh, to meet the throughput that the industry is needing is having qualified meat cutters that are ready to go straight onto the line without uh, an additional amount of training. And that's one thing that we would uh, we're currently working on, would love to uh, continue that conversation uh, with Fort Valley State as well as the rest of the educational uh, partners across the state. So um, biggest thing, I just want to touch on membership real quick. GCA is a, uh, is a membership organization. We were created in 1961. Uh, we are directed and formed by our members and we need you. Membership matters. It matters to producers. It gives them the uh, opportunity for educational um, opportunities throughout the year, opportunities to fellowship, uh, it gives them access to our magazine and uh, that provides expert articles monthly on different facets of the industry, whether that's forage, production, et cetera. Uh, and so for GCA, it, uh, it matters that we have you as a member. For us, our, our mission is to unite and advance the cattle industry in Georgia. And that's one of the things that we can't do without um, without members and so and then lastly one of the biggest things that gca does is uh, legislative representation and so numbers matter when it comes down to uh, voting and considerations for those members of congress whether they are uh, part of our delegation in dc or if they are here in the state it matters that they need to know who they are representing and who they're voting on behalf of and GCA having a uh, robust membership from across the state is important. So uh, I encourage anyone that would like to join GCA uh, to give us a call or visit our website. Um, and I'll include that information in the, uh, in the chat box as well. But uh, again, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. We're uh, appreciative of the effort that Fort Valley State University is putting into helping further our industry and moving that forward. Thank you. We have time for maybe one question. Um, if anybody has a burning question they'd like to ask. I'll, I'll ask one. Um, Dale, nice, nice, nice presentation. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if the situations in Tennessee is is worse than what's going on in Georgia in terms of capacity. Um, but I know the Tennessee, they just put in like $12 million to, to expand capacity, you know, expand current processing facilities. They're putting in, I think they're putting grants for maybe two or three mobile processing units and some other things. So what's the situation in Georgia in terms of, of processing capacity? And is there is there an effort to, to make moves to expand capacity for processing? Sure. So our situation is very similar. Um, we are, are currently at a deficit. We need more processing than what we have. Many of our producers have uh, have expanded their own operations and are getting into their own and building their own facilities. Uh, uh, as you saw in the pandemic, we saw a lot of our producers shift from that production focus selling only at the stockyard, uh, moving that over to selling freezer beef to friends and family. Uh, which is, is going to be critical for the future of our industry. But, um, you know, we're, we're not seeing the request for the mobile solder plants. Um, those come with their own challenges, as you very well know. Uh, every side's got to be USDA approved and inspected. And, um, so, and then at the, at the end of the day, you still have the chill cut and wrap component. Um, and so how do you how do you marry those two together? So that's one of the things that, that we are working on is trying to uh, develop additional focus on that. We, we actually had a feasibility study done prior to the pandemic on creating um, more so regional, smaller regional micro plants that would allow for faster throughput. Uh, you won't have that same aging capabilities that Fort Valley uh, State does, but uh, basically, pushing those cattle through and, and being able to achieve that. Uh, unfortunately, that was met with less than stellar um, results at the end of the day. I think a lot of producers were 
concerned that they didn't see the outcomes that they wanted. I think they really wanted a playbook that was basically here. You uh, you do all these things and you can get it off the ground. And unfortunately, that's that's going to be the, the big focus. But from our experience and, and what we've seen, especially in the past two years, has been focusing on the labor shortage. Um, many of our plants can't meet that throughput that they were originally designed for because they don't have the labor. And so uh, we thought that the, the, the capital capacity was, was the major concern, but really finding conventional financing is, is available out there for anyone wanting to, wanting to uh, go that route. Uh, but really labor is the linchpin and it, it affects everyone from FPL, who's our largest uh, processor in the state down to um, you know, someone like Mr. Joseph Egloff here in, in middle Georgia uh, that's only processing about 50 head a week. So, Yeah, that's the issue because I know there was one processor, actually a buyer from up in North Georgia said that there was a new processor just on the Georgia-Tennessee line, I think in Cleveland or somewhere close to Chattanooga, and they had opened up for like eight or ten months but couldn't find the labor. They had to shut down. Yeah. after eight or 10 months. And there was another process. So they were trying, they were getting, they were getting so much more um, um, requested. They're trying to find a, a second butcher to, to run a second shift and they couldn't find it. Right. We're, we're losing out a lot of those labor uh, forces to the grocery stores that can pay better benefits, um, the meat cutters inside, but also we're seeing offline plants and some of those mothball plants that have been uh, kind of decommissioned start to, to try and come back online. And the concern there is when, when you change a transfer of ownership from one packing plant to another owner, everything's gotta be brought up to today's standards. Yeah. You know, your asset plans, your uh, machinery equipment, you know, you can't use a worm screw if, if you're removing the waste. And so um, again, it it's a complicated and complex situation as you know, but uh, you know, I think ultimately the industry will get it figured out. It's just a matter of time, money, and effort, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll just close this comment that you know, and I didn't realize it until we got into it. You know, we're we're seeing a growth of local local marketing, locally produced, and so with that growth, I think that's a bottleneck yeah. in the whole this whole system is is processing capacity, and and so whether it's at the state level or at whatever level, there's got to be some more. Um, there can be some more some more attention. You know, placed on on processing capacity. Absolutely, and we've got some we've got some federal uh, bills that are going through now that would help address that, provide grants uh, and funding for the expansion or creation of additional processing. So, um, we're we're going to continue to fight um, from GCA's perspective. We just uh, hope everyone else jumps into the fight with us as being a member. Thanks. Um, thank you all. Um, before we do a few housekeeping in terms of, there's a lot of information in the chat and I do plan on going over that information with you all in terms of the evaluation. But before we do that, uh, I would like to give our Dean, Dr. Ralph Noble, an opportunity to say a few words uh, before we give our closing comments and end with the evaluation. So at this time, I present uh, Dr. Ralph Noble, Dean here at Fort Valley State of the College of Agriculture. Well, I want to really welcome everyone for being here. It's been a real good program. I think topics that we've probably not spent enough time on. Uh, we've been spending a lot more time on production and not as much on marketing. So having uh, Mr. Hollis talk about our facility here in middle Georgia is something that's a short supply of what we can do to work together I think. So hearing from the Georgia Cattlemen Association and the rest of us from Florida, Tennessee, it's, it looks like it's a regional issue. And so it's something I can see is working out with. So. We do have other people online that's been listening to us, uh, even Dr. Hodges. You know, he's working with, the, he's a veterinarian, one of our graduates with the Critter Fixer movie. He's been listening on cattle process as well. So we're getting some good attention from folks. There he is there. So Dr. Hodges, appreciate you being online with us. Okay. And so these are the people that have support for what we're doing. And so having these, these presentations by extension, allow us to gather, even though we may be limited in terms of how far we can travel, this has been fantastic. So I enjoyed the topics. I'm uh, glad to hear from everyone and look forward for some more information from Fort Valley. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nobles. Um, for those of you, if you would check, if, if you haven't been looking at your chat, chat box, we actually encourage at this particular point in time, you look at your chat box. Uh, this is the closing of our program, but we're going to leave it open because like I said, a lot of information has been put in the chat box 
And with all of that information being put at the chat box and at the same time, listening to the speakers, we didn't want to overwhelm you because it is a lot. We did want to make sure that you had an opportunity to hear the speakers, but also take advantage of the information that is put in the chat box. So at this time, we're going to pretty much focus on the information that is in the chat box. Dr. Whitley uh, put several things in the chat box, and I will regurgitate several of those. Uh, she mentioned AgriUnity uh, and Mr. Handy Kennedy, and Kennedy in terms of being the contact for that. Uh, that information is in the chat box. So if you're interested in that organization and what that organization is doing, uh, that information is in the chat box. Uh, she also, uh, we also have our evaluation, but I'm gonna talk about that a little later. Several workshops Dr. Whitley mentioned, um, one being June the 3rd and one being June the 8th, um, which is gonna be at the uh, small room in the center. Uh, though there is a link in this chat box that you can click on, that you can register and you can register for each of those uh, workshops through that link. And it is mentioned that these will be in-person meetings only, uh, meaning there will not be a virtual option for attending these. Um, there's a beef quality assurance workshop slash certification, and that is going to be on a Saturday, June 19th, uh, beginning at 9.30, and is going to be on Handy Kennedy's farm, which is in Cobbtown. There is a registration link uh, to register for that workshop as well. And with that being said, also, uh, we have the link. One of the reasons how we do this, the way we do this, we ask for you all feedback as participants. Again, thank you all for coming. Um, but your input is important to us as we design these programs and present them to you. The format that we present them to you, whether virtual or face-to-face, uh, we need you all's feedback. We want to continue to bring you our educational program, but we want to bring the educational programs to you in the format for which you are willing to receive it. With that being said, we have an evaluation link that is in the chat box, and it was sent to you all from a Mr. Stinson Troutman, uh, one of our county extension agents here within the College of Agriculture. And at this time, we ask that if you all would basically look at that evaluation link and click on it, and please fill it out for us, please, before you get off here. Now, we are going to do our due diligence. We understand in the interest of time, we are about 18 minutes over. Uh, we were scheduled to end at 1.30. We, it is now 1.48. Uh, but it is critical that we get feedback from you. All of our programs are essential, and we want to steadily improve them. And we can only improve them through feedback. So it is important that you do complete the evaluation. If you aren't able to complete it here, we do understand. We will be sending um, a link out to each of you all who registered to your email address um, after this presentation, probably sometime tomorrow, and then maybe uh, one or two more times in the interest of trying to get as much feedback as we possibly can on the evaluation link. So we ask at this time, if you would take a few moments and complete that link if you had the time. Uh, we thank you for being with us. Um, and if there aren't any more questions or any more burning things that people have and or comments, uh, thank you for your time and patience. Uh, we also have the gentleman from the Georgia Cattlemen's Association. He has put his contact information in the chat box. So we ask that you take a stroll through the chat box just to get all the information that is put in there. And if you have any questions about any other things that have been stated on here and or what we put in the chat box, please reach out to us and let us know. And we'll try to get back to you the best we can and, and answer your question and get you the information that you, need, that you need. And at this time, I will turn it back over to Mr. Solomon. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Thomas. Uh, I hope y'all enjoyed our educational and informational program. And that's what we're here for. I appreciate your attendance. And have a nice and lovely and stay safe the rest of your day. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. And like I said, please feel free to look at the chat box and click on that uh, evaluation. Again, it came from Mr. Stinson Troutman. Uh, it's in there twice. Um, I think more so if you scroll up toward the top 
of your chat at the beginning of the chat, that is the one that actually have a live link. The second one that is sent that was sent at 141, uh, that link currently is not live, so you wouldn't be able to click on that one. But if you scroll toward the top of your chat, the earlier one, uh, which was sent at 1214 today, you should be able to click on that link and complete that evaluation for us. And anybody with Thank a good you. voice while anybody with a good voice while we are feeling this survey out that would like to sing us a nice song, feel free to do so. <laughs> there is no compensation for that. That is strictly your <laughs> donation to Fort Valley State University. <laughs> <laughs> and be sure to check out our website for anything that you missed on here in terms of our dates. Information will be on our website. And it is ag.fdsu. And again, we thank all of our speakers, Mr. Hollis, Dr. Brown, Dr. Whitley, Mr. Lancaster. And we thank the Georgia Cattlemen's Association for being a part of this program as well. Then I would be remiss if I didn't mention our county staff. They have been working diligently behind the scenes uh, in terms of registering, making sure that all the details that go into uh, putting on a program like this uh, run smoothly. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank each of them, uh, of our county agents that have been working behind the scenes, even though they have been on here, uh, they have been working diligently behind the scenes to make sure that all technical issues and everything like that operating within this program run smoothly. So we do want to thank them for their uh, time, energy, and expertise as well. 